Well, welcome everyone, and thanks for joining us today for the first of a three-part series focusing on a variety of Google tools for journalists. Today, we'll learn about fundamentals uh, such as advanced search, Google Trends, and Pinpoint. Everyone is muted during the webinar. If you have any questions as we go along, please type them in the Q&A section on your screen, and we'll get back. We'll get to them at the end of the session. Our trainer for this series is Mary Nahorniak, who is Google News Lab's U.S. Teaching Fellow, focused on collaborating with journalists and entrepreneurs to drive innovation in news. She was previously part of USA Today's leadership team as the director of audience and was responsible for the organization's digital platforms and a round-the-clock team of nearly 30 editors. Mary was one of the first journalists pioneering how newsrooms can directly connect with audiences through social platforms, beginning at the Baltimore Sun in the mid-2000s. She has also worked as an editor at News Trust Baltimore, the Richmond Times Dispatch, and the Virginian Pilot. Mary is also an ACC certified leadership coach and has helped clients at ESPN, Harvard Business Review, and the US Department of Justice define and realize their goals. Welcome, Mary. Thank you. Shall I take it away? You can take it away. Hi, everyone. I'm so glad to be here with you today. The very first thing I'm going to do right before I share my screen is I'm putting into the chat for all of you a Google Docs link. Please let me know if you can't access it. It should be available. And it's a cheat sheet for today. We're going to go over a lot of different sites. Um, there's a lot to cover today. And I hope you find it useful. But don't feel like you have to screenshot, take notes. You're welcome to, but it's all should be there for you in the cheat sheet. And I'm going to use that single document every week. So we're going to have three sessions. I'll talk about those in a minute and I'll continue to add to it as we go throughout. So that's the best link for you to hang on to. And so the next thing I'm going to do is share my screen. And every time I do this, I talk very slowly. Okay, here we go. Um, and again, let me know if you can't see that. So um, as Deanna mentioned, do let me know if you have questions in the chat as we go along. I'm going to make sure I have it open and just sliding it over on a different screen. Um, and I will do my best to sort of keep an eye on it, address anything as it comes up, and then can certainly get to it at the end as well. So let's dive in. So today we're doing three fundamental tools, advanced search, trends, and pinpoint. Um, and we are gonna be here together um, if you'll continue to join me, and I hope you will three times. So next week at the same time, and then there's one week of a break and then we'll be back again together on February 18th. And this is our plan for those sessions. So again, fundamentals today, visualization and geo tools like My Maps and Google Earth next week. And then pinpoint, or excuse me, that should actually say newsroom innovation, I apologize. So we'll do innovation for our third session together. Um, just a little bit of an expanded intro. So Deanna mentioned, um, I've lived in Virginia the most number of times in my life. So I was a military kid. And then, you know, in, in journalism, we often move a lot. I've lived in Yorktown, Norfolk twice, Richmond, Springfield. And then I live in the Bay Area now in California, but I moved here from uh, Maryland, the DC area, just a little bit a year ago. So I've been a journalist for about 20 years um, and I'm really happy to be in this role, supporting you with tools and with training. So any questions you might have, you're welcome to reach out to me directly. I'd love to hear from you. If you'd like a training like this for your own newsroom, I'm happy to do that. My role is simply to train journalists in the US. So um, please let's do talk. All right, so diving in just a little bit deeper um, as for sort of how this comes together via Google. So I'm part of the Google News Lab, which is part of the Google News Initiative. It's Google's effort to help build a stronger future for journalism. There are a lot of different ways that we do that. Training is of course, my focus, but we also have a number of other programs and folks working on some really interesting things. You probably know about some of our grant programs. If you don't, I'm happy to share some information about that if you send me a note as well. And the first URL for today is our training website. So g.co slash news training. Everything I go over today and in future days um, is here as a training you can walk through at your own pace. They usually only take about five to 10 minutes. So don't feel intimidated by the idea of doing a training and it's a great resource. Most people are hands-on learners or experiential learners and we learn by doing. So I know we're all two years in the pandemic used to taking in information virtually, but still we often learn it best when we do it. So I'd encourage you to play around with the tools that we go over today and then visit this website if you need more of a walkthrough and you can also share that with your colleagues. All right, let's 
head over to advanced search. So um, everything we go over today should feel like there's something new for folks who are digital veterans who've been doing this for a while. And then, um, it, you know, if you're kind of newer to this, I also think it, it builds sort of progressively. So if at first you think, yeah, I know this, I've used that before, great. And then what I'm gonna do is show you how we can put things together in really interesting ways. So for advanced search, just thinking about searching as part of the research phase of projects, the perfect search engine should understand exactly what you mean and give you back exactly what you want, said Google founder, Larry Page. I think if we think about that for a minute, it usually doesn't work that way, right? It's like we sort of have all these hacks and we don't even consciously really think about them anymore. We just find ways to kind of get at what we want. And so until this magical day where search works exactly the way that our brains work, um, we have to do what we call search modifiers, search refinements. So I'm gonna go over six of those today that I think are particularly useful for journalists. And um, I think there are 42 or 43 search modifiers and in your cheat sheet is a link to a blog post about all of those 42 or 43. Many of them are, are a bit esoteric, but I think these will resonate with you all. So the first one I wanna share with you that many of you may have used is to just remove a piece of information or a word from a search. So if you wanna know the speed of a Jaguar car, you would remove the word cat. And if you want to know the speed of a Jaguar cat, you would remove the word car. Great for recipe searching. If you're looking for, let's say, a salsa recipe that doesn't have cilantro in it because you, like me, might think it's awful, um, you can do that as well. And sometimes this just comes up as we search for sometimes like a person, right, with a very similar name. Their search results get mixed in with the ones we're really looking for. So this is a way of increasing the signal to noise ratio. Um, site search is another one. So this is site colon, and then you put in the website. This does not have to be a homepage. This could be a story page. It could be any URL. The way that I've set this search up is to search the times for news about Pfizer. But if I do just a general web search on Pfizer, which you see on the left, I get a bunch of very general information. I get news about stock price. I get the location of Pfizer, like the sort of Wikipedia blurb things that I'm probably not looking for already as a journalist, I'm trying to get at what is the latest with Pfizer news. So this is a way of searching on a specific site. You can use this in a bunch of really interesting ways. One that I use it at USA Today, sometimes if your site search just isn't returning results to you in a way that you expect or is useful, and I actually find this with the times. So, so I will go to Google and put in site newyorktimes.com and then do my search because the sorts, the results are not as relevant or they're just not funneling the way that I would like to. And so I would do the same at USA Today. If it's just, I read this article, I know it was by so-and-so and it's not coming up. This is a great way to sort of do it from the side. And a couple of other ways to think about that are that it's very difficult to search on Facebook for groups and for pages. Facebook search leaves a lot to be desired. And so you can do it from Google, from the side door. So site colon facebook.com slash groups or facebook.com slash pages. This would be searching for those things maybe on a certain topic. If you're looking for a community group or maybe groups about a town where you are or even a topic, this is a way to find those. And then if you think about breaking that out even further, once you have a, maybe let's say a group URL, you could put that whole URL into the search bar. So site colon, the entire group URL, and then search for something within that, right? A person's name or a topic. Um, so thinking about like how we can really make this helpful for finding what people are saying about a certain thing. You can also do the same for Twitter lists, also very difficult to search on Twitter. So the way that this is set up is site colon twitter.com slash asterisk slash lists, the asterisk means any name could go here, right? So it belongs to any user, we're saying. Uh, all of them are fine, and then we pick our topic. So in this case, my colleagues set this search up to search for lists for the alt-right as a way of monitoring the conversation there, right? What's being talked about. And then you can pop them in your tweet deck and just sort of keep an eye on stuff. So that can be really interesting. You can also search, use that site colon search for a whole set of sites. So the TLD is the .com or the .whatever at the end of a URL. And this is saying, let's search only official .gov or government sites for news about the COVID vaccine. And what happened when I ran that search, 
if I just search for COVID vaccine on Google, I do get very reputable information right away. I get CDC as the number one result, and then I get news stories. But if I search for .gov sites, I'm getting Orlando, I'm getting the VA, I'm getting all kinds of interesting stuff from official .gov sites. You could also use this for .edu, so searching for um, information on college sites, specifically .orgs for official nonprofits, .mil, um, depending on what you cover. So this can be a way of just kind of, you're narrowing from the biggest set, but you're also keeping it broad enough because you don't know exactly what you're gonna find yet. This is one that I did not know about before I started this job, which was very exciting to learn it. So this is a related site search. And this is saying, hey, Google, tell me what is like a certain site. So the use case here would be, if I search Google for gettyimages.com, I'm gonna go to gettyimages.com. If I search Google for sites that are like Getty, I'm going to get a bunch of other photography sites, stock photography, and helping me just start to see these are all options for what I'm looking for. So you could use this for like trying to find royalty-free music for videos, um, thinking of it in a repertorial sense. So if I'm reporting on a company or a person, what other companies are like this? What other people are like this person if they have their own website? And just starting to get a sense of the web around something I like it as a little bit of a gut check for um, like, do I already know what all of these things are as I'm reporting on this? If so, yes, move to the next step. If not, maybe a little bit of clicking around and, and checking on some of those rabbit holes could lead you somewhere interesting. Um, this is another really useful one. So this is cache colon and cache will take you to the last cached version of a page, meaning this is the last one that was scraped and stored by Google. So new sites, of course, update very frequently, um, but this is really, really useful for government sites, things that just don't update that often, whitehouse.gov. Um, this is a searching the Swedish government's press release page on their site. So when something was posted and then it disappears later, this is a great way of going a step back and being able to find it in some cases. So especially when you're looking for some older information that's disappeared, this can even be a way of finding old tweets. Sometimes it's not perfect, but it does work at times. Um, so can be super, super useful. And even just like as information changes. So maybe one of your own stories or your colleague's stories going to the last version of it. What did it say? How did it change? Um, maybe a competitor, right? What did, what did they update the last time they updated? What, what part is new? So thinking about that cache as a really useful. Uh, search. And then um, this is similar. It's not a Google tool, but I like to share it. If you haven't used the Wayback Machine at archive.org in a little while, it's worth um, a gander. It could be a great place to while away an hour, or if you're just looking for what did this site used to look like on a certain date, um, or even way back in time, what Twitter used to look like and when it was founded, there could just be some really interesting gems that can be um, some nice stories and or can be a way of finding Again, disappeared information. This can be a way of finding tweets that have been removed, um, posts, things like that. It's not perfect, but it's definitely one you wanna have in your arsenal. And then I wanna share this as just an example of how it can be used um, and was used in the real world. So if we can remember all the way back to February of 2020, which was 6 million years ago in COVID time adjusted, but on the CDC's website, there was the testing data around COVID, right? This virus is starting to really percolate. What's, if you're a health reporter, you're following this every day probably, and you probably have this page bookmarked. So on the left, we can see the testing data for the United States at that time. Very few tests administered, but um, I can see 472 and then number of positive. And then one day in early March, so the right side screenshot, that um, table had disappeared. So if, again, if you're that health reporter at that time, you're thinking, where's this information? I need to check on this every day. This story is becoming bigger and bigger. Um, and so before picking up the phone, what you might wanna do is check the cache. So go to cache colon, paste this whole URL in, and then just be able to say, this is what it looked like on the last day that it was scraped. I do remember that it was there. And now I might go ahead and, and make that call and ask where did, it, where did this information go? And it turned out that at that time where it went, which again, if you're that health reporter, maybe you panic and you think Trump's making it disappear or somebody wants it taken down. 
what actually happened then is that information started to be reported out at the state level instead of the federal level, which is what we're used to now, two years into this thing. So um, just keeping that one in mind. I see we have a question about trends. Great, we will get to that, thank you. Um, okay, this was where it starts to get really awesome. So if, if you knew all of that stuff, I commend you. Um, if you have not done a file type search, this can be really powerful. So the way that this is set up is if you search Google for the word expenses, you're going to get a definition of the word, which is not helpful. We all know what that is. But if you search for expenses that are CSV files, this is what that would look like. And now you're starting to get at some real information, some actual data sets that you can hopefully download and start to play with and look at. If you think about other file types that might be supported, so PDFs, um, I mentioned .mil earlier and, and somebody in a previous session noted that the military loves to use PowerPoints to share information. So you might search PPT, um, you can search XLS. So you're looking for a certain type of file. And again, expenses just our keyword, but what you can do, this is where it starts to get really awesome is combine a bunch of the things we just looked at together. So let me slow it down for a sec and sh share what this one is. So this is searching the CIA website for PDF files that have the word secret in the title. And I definitely want to know what's there, right? The first time I saw the search, I was just like, I got to know what's at this results page. And this is something I want to run like every Sunday night at midnight or every Monday at 8 a.m. or something like that. So also thinking about file type PPT site.mil, right? Or whatever your specific site might be. Um, .edu for PDFs, maybe site fda.gov for Excel files to get your hands on some of the data that might be being shared around COVID. So there are a lot of interesting ways that all of this stuff is publicly posted and sometimes it's just really hard to find. And this lets you cut through the clutter, cut through some websites that are difficult to navigate and just see what's there. So for those CIA search results, what we saw at that time was this. There were, there were only three results. But again, if I'm running the search, I want to read all three of these and I want to know if there's some news in them. Maybe there isn't, maybe there is, but I definitely want to know what's there. So um, this can be used in a bunch of different ways. If your wheels are turning a little bit and you have some ideas about how you might use it, I'd love to hear about that in the chat. Um, so this can, you can, there's really no limit to the number of modifiers you can do. And again, we think about these things are called search modifiers, search refinements. When we do just a general web search, we often are used to seeing hundreds of thousands of results. And we're pretty good at quickly sorting out the noise, right? And what this is doing is it's refining and it's narrowing our results so much so that we should only be getting what's super relevant to what we're looking for. So that's where I think sometimes it's scary to see there's only three, right? But they are the three that I wanna look at. And then thinking about a search that might work for you. So that CIA search or whatever it might be, again, like thinking, I wanna run this every Sunday at midnight or every Monday at 8 a.m. You actually don't have to. What you could do is turn all of that into a Google alert. So if you've, if you've got a Google alert that you love or maybe one that isn't even working for you, I, again, put it in the chat and love to see it. But what you can do is use all these search modifiers for an alert. So you're essentially saying, every time there's something new on this, I want an email, or I just want an email every Monday at eight with everything that was shared in the last week. So really good for beat related stuff, things that you just need to keep an eye on. Maybe you don't need like the super fast speed of it, but you just wanna make sure you're always a little bit on top of what's there. This can be a really helpful way of making it work for you. So my boss, who's based in the UK, um, he was a reporter in Ireland, and he said, this is the only tool that will bring stories you don't already know about to your inbox. And his example was, he would create searches for the holding company names of the companies that he was covering. So of course, public facing names are not always the same as like the ownership name, and we all know that. But the ownership holding company name is the one that's going to show up in lawsuits. It's the one that's going to show up in other really interesting things, SEC filings. So if you've got, if you're a business reporter and, you, and you've got businesses that you cover regularly that are based in your city or whatever it might be, this is where you can just go. Anytime there's something involving this company, I need to know about it. And you may be the only person covering that beat that has this search. So you will be getting scoops. 
Okay, the second part of our advanced search, moving out of search modifiers, is I want to show you five um, specialized search engines. So of course, Google is our biggest search engine, searches everything. What these all will do is search only specific types of things. Um, I've jumped ahead a little bit. I just realized, I'm sorry. So the last thing to just share on search modifiers is this advanced search page. And what that means is you don't have to remember anything I just shared with you. You can always go to the advanced search page and it's gonna prompt you for any of the possibilities that we just talked about. So this exact phrase, but none of these words, I only want results in English, I only want results in Spanish, I only want .gov, whatever it might be, you can fill it all out here. So you don't have to uh, retain this to memory. You can just use the advanced search page. There is also an advanced video search page. It's not just Google or YouTube videos, it's everything. So you can search for, I'm looking for videos on a certain topic here. What I've done is in California, we have a type of storm called an atmospheric river, which being East Coast based my whole life, I'd never heard of. And it's essentially just so much rain above you that it's like a river. But if the atmospheric river originated in Hawaii, it's also called a pineapple express, which is just a very fun fact. So in this case, what I've done is I'm searching for videos of atmospheric river storms, but I don't want any that are pineapple express. And what I get is just a bunch of videos from the West Coast of this certain type of storm. So thinking about the kinds of things that I know you guys are dealing with some wintry weather, it sounds like it's been a pretty snowy January, um, tornadoes touching down, looking for videos on certain things. All right, so for the specialized search engines, again, those were all very, using the regular Google search engine, but using it in very specific ways to hone in on the information that you are looking for. This is a totally different one called Google Scholar, and it searches two things and two things only. And I'm going to actually just go to it so we can see it together. If you've used it, I'd love to know. Um, so the two things that it searches, the first is case law. So let's just go in here. I'm going to just click California courts just to move us to the page. And then what I want to show you is the ability to search through case law at many different types of court systems. So I'm scrolling down for Virginia. And if I click it, these are the two state level courts, the Court of Appeals and the Virginia Supreme Court. And if I only want to search through there, once I click done, then I can start to look for anything really. See if there have been any vaccine cases, vaccine mandates coming through. And so this is just a much simpler way of searching case law than it might be to go through the court system. From your search results page, you can refine your results. So you can say, I'm only looking for something really new, 2022, or I can do a custom range. I remember a case and it was sometime in the early 2000s. You can go in and type in 2000 to maybe 2010, something like that. You can take out citations if you wish. And again, if you make this useful to you, you can create an alert out of here, just like we talked about with regular Google search. So I wanna just run this on Google Scholar every week, every two weeks, anytime there's something new, whatever that might be, you can do that here as well. So again, that's for case law. What I wanna do is just go back quickly to the front of Google Scholar. So the other thing that you can search through here called articles, not the best word for our purposes because we think of those as news articles. But what this is, is this is academic papers. Um, on a certain topic, right? So what we're doing is we're searching through academic works. And um, if I don't have it in your cheat sheet, I will add it, but there's a page that I can share with you that shares what can be included in Google Scholar. It's a, it's a little bit convoluted. So generally what you wanna think about it is like, it's not everything. And um, for example, if something isn't on the web, if it's just in like a printed scholarly paper, you're not gonna find it here things that you might have to pay to get to aren't always included as well because that's not a good search experience. But it is just a way of starting to boil down some of these other things that can be hard to find on a regular Google search. And so what I'll share is why you might use it. So I love it as a way of backgrounding anything. You're on the research phase of something, what's a good story? And then who might I wanna talk to? So if I wanna do a story on vaccine hesitancy, maybe like the history of it in the US, 
I can start to look at who has written scholarly papers on these things. And those are going to be excellent people for me to call. So on this one first, for example, I'm sure you all have seen pages like this. You've got your lead author with the contact button right away. You've got four or five other people to talk to. So this can be really good for finding people to talk to on nuanced topics, which is something that I would often find is like, I've got a great idea. Who's gonna to talk to me about it? How will I find them? This I think can be a really nice way of doing so. You can also use those same um, search modifiers here. So if I wanna just get at vaccine hesitancy and not include COVID, I can do that. Um, the other thing that I think can be really useful is finding diverse sources. So going beyond the people that we usually call that we've, we know they're gonna pick up, they're gonna give us a good quote and they're gonna do it on a quick timeline. We all know why that's helpful, but we also know that at times when we're not in a rush, we're really looking for a different perspective. This could be a great way of finding diverse sources. One, again, beyond the people we use, usually call, but two, people of color, LGBTQ folks, women in underrepresented um, areas, a different type of person to call that we wanna hear from more often that reflects the audience, reflects the community and reflects a different point of view. So this can be a great way of finding those folks, which I would guess you could start to get at rather quickly by looking at some of the author information, going to their bio pages, et cetera. If you also do um, source analysis at your site, this can be a great way of showing folks how to broaden beyond it, beyond who we're usually talking to. Okay, so that's Google Scholar. Again, helpful for sources, court cases, um, academic articles and the topics included. The next thing I wanna show you is data set search. This is a search engine that only searches for data sets. Let's see if I've got it. Recent searches, no I don't. So toolbox.google.com. Data set search, here we go. So again, this is only going to return data sets. This would replicate that XLS or CSV file type search that we were running, but it's a faster, maybe broader way of doing it. You may be including more than instead of trying to having to design it yourself. So if I search for COVID, see what we get. So I'm starting, it's already starting to recommend to me what we have here. We've got COVID data sets from healthdata.gov. We've got the New York Times data set, which we of course know to be very reputable. We've got Johns Hopkins, which many news organizations are using for large COVID data. And what we see here, so this isn't a data set, of course, but what we're what Google is letting us know is this is what's available to you. So if I go to the Times one, for example, I've got two options. I can go to the Times and go play with it, or I can go to GitHub and I can see what's available. And so on GitHub right here, I can see that the live file and the rolling averages file were updated in the last day. So these are available to you to download and use, and they're also being updated very regularly. So that could be super helpful. And again, if you are the type of person and many, if not most reporters are this, you want that data for yourself. This is a great way of finding it, saving it down to your computer. What might you do from there? You could upload it to Google Sheets and sort of mess around with it. You could visualize things, you could map them. You could take out just what you need on Virginia and exclude all the other data sets. And it's, it's yours to sort of handle a play with. Maybe you just save it, right? Maybe you're saving something every month for several years until someday you've got yourself some piece of some really interesting story out of the data. So again, just giving you data set results on data set search. There are a few others that I think I'm not gonna do the live demo on in the interest of time, but I'll just quickly talk through them. And again, all of these are in your cheat sheet. So I would encourage you to explore them. Um, I would say ideally today or tomorrow before this flies out of our brains as things do for me, certainly after it's been presented to me. Um, public data is a site where you can start to play with data sets. So it's pulling in data from places like the Bureau of Labor Statistics, the US Census, um, a bunch of really interesting sources are being already called into this site. You can then build graphs from there. You can just explore the data if you're looking for stories on things like 
birth rate and how did it drop from 2020 on, or certainly like unemployment figures, um, construction costs, all the types of things that make for really good stories. This is where you can start to play with the data, explore it, and then if you build a graph, you can embed it in your story. So anything that you build will always have a little piece of embed code that you could carry over to your CMS. So that one can be pretty cool. It is the precursor to this. This is called the Common Knowledge Project. It's a little bit easier to use. And what you can do is just build charts off of either topics or even locations. So you could just put in Virginia as a location or your city and just start to see what kind of charts can I make? What kind of data can I see? So you can see things like demographic breakdown, you can see health information, you can get crime information. All of those graphs can be embedded in your stories and they can be interactive, right? So your users can actually play with them too. So this can be um, a really interesting, again, the data is being pulled in already. You're not having to go find that raw data set and then you can make something from there. Or if you're like, new tier news organization, or as we talked about, if you're moving around quite a bit, when I moved to California, I just went and built as many charts on California as I could just to start to learn about this new place that I'm living and start to think about what are the people like here? What are the stories here? And the last one, I think I will actually show you this one. This is called Fact Check Tool, Fact Check Explorer. And what it does is it searches through fact checks. And what that means, I did it right. Yay. If you are producing, if your news organization is producing fact checks, you can code them up, you can mark them up as fact checks to be included in here. And what that, what's really important about that. So my first question when I learned about this was how do I know that things that aren't real are showing up in here? And any news organization that's already showing up in Google News, which has a pretty strict set of criteria to be a part of, they would be included in here. So it won't be any other site that just pops up out of nowhere. So the only miss or disinformation that you should find in here would be um, that which is being debunked. So if you produce fact checks, you'll wanna click on markup tool and get some information about how you can mark those fact checks up to be included. And if you're just looking for information, we can start to look for fact checks about any kind of topic, place. I will often just run a state search. So if you're searching for Virginia, here we've got lots, you know, we all are experiencing the amount of bad information that's out there, sometimes shared by mistake, sometimes done nefariously, but this is a great way of getting our arms around what are those things? And then do we want to do a story on it? And maybe we don't. But if I think back to the beginning of my career, if something wasn't happening, it wasn't a story for the most part, right? So if it's like a bus ran into a building downtown, somebody calls us, tells us that, we run over there, no bus, no story, we're not writing that up. But now that information is spreading in really viral ways, and some of that information is, of course, as we know, can be really harmful, we're starting to think of it differently. If a lot of people think something is true, do we have a responsibility as a journalist or a desire to simply debunk it, right? To share what is actually true, to share some real information. So this can be a good way of seeing what's already been done on that topic. Again, is it something that I wanna pick up for my news organization? How might I do it? So um, you can also guess there's plenty of results if you run a COVID search on here as well. Okay, and that is Fact Check Explorer. So we've got 25 minutes left, which is pretty good. I will just take a quick pause the next thing we're going to look at is trends, but I know I just shared a lot of information with you. It can feel overwhelming, I know, so I'll just, just give a minute in case anybody has any questions before we move on. Okay, if you have questions, just pop them in the chat, let me know. Otherwise, let's move to trends. And I'll just start with the question. So Carrie says, we're trying to get Twitter verified. And one of the things they ask for is a Google Trends profile. I can't figure out exactly what that is. Well, I don't know what that is either, Carrie. That's really odd. So at USA Today, I was regularly helping people get verified and I've never heard of that, nor do I know what a Google Trends profile is. I think if, 
if it's something that they're asking for, what I would probably just do is like search the domain name um, and send maybe a link of their results. And then I would guess that Twitter would come back to you and clarify what they are asking for, but that is strange. So trends, again, like search for those of you, I hope we have some trends veterans on the call. If you've got questions, let me know. But I also hope there's some people who aren't using it and who are ready to, because I think it is such a powerful tool for figuring out what people are saying, the stories that we wanna do, the angles we wanna tackle. Um, what I have here is top searched Oscar best picture winners by year from 2005 forward. And this is a visualization done in Flourish, which we're gonna go over next week but the data is all from Google Trends. So it's how people are searching. And the, I just love this one. It's just really interesting to look at, it's engaging. And then Titanic, this blue one is just always near the top, which just always makes me laugh, the enduring legacy of Titanic in pop culture. So for trends, what I wanna go through just to start kind of big is to show you what's possible, like that graphic with trends, how you might use this information. I wanna share some resources with you, then we're gonna do a live demo on the site. Um, this is another Flourish graphic. It's called the horse race chart. These were the search popularity of the Jeopardy guest host earlier last year, which of course that story has evolved far beyond this moment in time. But we can see Aaron Rodgers was the top searched um, Jeopardy guest host. We have LeVar Burton, kind of this lavender line down the middle if you were reading Rainbow Kid. That always makes me smile. So it's just the type of thing that is possible. And I'll also note again for trends veterans, what you might be thinking is how they get all those names on there. On the public facing trends website, we can only search for up to five things at a time. But if you have something big that you wanna do, you can always reach out to the trends team and they will get back to you. You can do it through me or um, there's a news lab support email in your cheat sheet. You can reach out there as well. So I had somebody reach out um, around Thanksgiving for like the most popular Thanksgiving dishes in every state, the types of things like thinking about what you could do with that search data. It's also just a good opportunity to talk about, just go back to it really quickly, what it actually means to be trending. So I think this is really important if you're going to use trends data, either as the basis of a story or even just include a little bit in a story. What we wanna be clear about is that search interest does not equate to popularity for something like an election. It doesn't mean that this person is likely to be the winner. I think we all know that consciously, but it's important to just peel it apart. The way that I think of search information is a factor of curiosity. So it's just people wanna know more about something or they wanna know about someone. I heard they said something, I'd like to explore that. My friends keep talking about such and such, I wanna know about it. So they're just curious, doesn't mean good, bad, or any other um, like subjective label on it. It's just what people wanna know about. For resources, the first I'll share with you is the Trends Twitter site. I just think it's a great follow. Every day you're gonna get different trends information. They're not always pop culture, um, but I've just pulled those out for the, this presentation. These are from Star Wars Day, which is May 4th. May the 4th be with you. And we are able to see the most searched Star Wars movies and if people search more for Yoda or baby Yoda, as my daughter calls this one, old Yoda. And so we can just see that in 2021, baby Yoda was more popular, searched more often than old Yoda. So every day there's something new. They did a really interesting set of stuff for the Summer Olympics. I expect the same for the Winter Olympics coming up. Um, every day was like a new sport um, on the Twitter account. So just a good follow. The one that I absolutely love, if you don't already get the trends email, I highly, highly recommend it. I'm going to actually pull over yesterday's. So the trends email comes out usually around probably early afternoon East Coast time, maybe between like 12 and three. Today's is not here yet, but this is yesterday's. So you're gonna get a couple of topics that are just trending and you'll always be able to see where it's trending and sort of maybe not why, but I think we like walk up to this sort of knowing why. But for example, yesterday there were searches on Peter Dinklage. He was talking about um, the uh, Snow White remake that's coming out. So we can see that search is up 350%. Um, and he was just sort of saying like, thanks for updating Snow White, but you forgot to update the dwarfs. And lots of people searching about the SAT, which is, so you can see it's a breakout search. 
What that means is that it has 5,000% more interest than the previous day, meaning this is a spiking spot news story and lots of interest in that from teenagers, from their parents, from college admissions, um, counselors. So there's a bunch of stories to be done on that. And this is a way of kind of getting at, if you're doing a story on this for your site, you can start to see what are people wondering. So no longer if you're doing an FAQ, do you just have to sit there and think about what do I think are the frequently asked questions? And I've certainly done that. Or what are my questions? We can actually start to see what questions do people have? And then let's answer them, right? So they just want to sort of break down. What does this mean? Where are people looking for the SAT? We usually get some charts, maps, et cetera. So I love, love the trends email for just a quick, again, that early afternoon time is kind of like, do I have everything I want to have? If not, what might I need to get assigned or start to work on? Um, and just giving you that sort of big picture of what's trending. I'm gonna close some of these tabs as we go forward. Uh, the trends team also will often put together these resource pages. You'll find them when you get the email and you can just bookmark it. So we've got this vaccine trends page. There's a Black Lives Matter page, climate change, a lot of these long running stories that you can certainly look for on trends, but the trends team has done it for us and saved us some time. And then I'll also just quickly call up this one that they put together late last year, which is how people are searching for COVID symptoms. So this was done, I think pre-Omicron, but we can start to see for US-based information. I'm sure that you all have read and maybe even worked on stories where what people are searching, when they're searching for symptoms, it often can be overlaid along a spike in that illness, right? So the beginning of flu season, certainly with COVID, we've been able to see that. And so there's a lot of information here that we can start to play with and see what people are looking for. All right, let's go to the trend site. Enough talking about trends. Let's look at what's trending. Let's look at what questions you have. If I could learn to type, that would be helpful. So, two ways of using trends. One is to run a search for something specific, which we're gonna do in a second. The other is to kind of like the email, just see what's trending. So if I go over here to trending searches, I've got two choices and I can see what stories are trending today. And um, we're kind of midway, I guess, through the day at this point. So there's plenty of stuff here. It's Holocaust Remembrance Day, um, lots of sports is always in here. What we can see on this page is we're never gonna get the raw numbers of people searching for something. Google doesn't release that data, but many times I, my assumption is it's in the millions. And what this is telling us is there's just a hundred thousand more searches than usual. So we can start to see some of this information here. The one I really like though is real-time search trends. It moves faster, it updates more frequently and you can start to really dive into something. So we can see the spark lines here for how something is trending. Lots of sports news today. So let's go down here. Let's look at Roethlisberger. What I wanna do is open up this item so I can quickly see some news stories about it. So if we don't know why something is trending, this is gonna tell us why. And then I can start to see related queries. So when people search for this thing, they're also searching for these. And these related queries to me, all the places you can find them on trends are the hidden gold of Google Trends. So when people are curious about X, they're also curious about Y. Sometimes you might go, well, of course they're searching for other quarterbacks, right? Or they're just searching for NFL news. If they're interested in one, they're interested in another. But this is also where you can often find a really specific angle, something that you might have expertise in, or maybe find somebody who can talk about a certain topic to do like an op-ed for you you can start to find just starting to get at how people search can be really interesting once you get really comfortable with it, um, how you might make those stories come to life as you start to understand the way that trends are searched for. So let's see, I don't know if there's much else I wanna explore here. The other thing I'll just point out is you can sort by category. So if you're a business reporter, you can just look for trending business stories. You can just look for trending sports stories and start to sort out. We're gonna see a lot here that we saw on that main homepage. 
you can only search at the country level. So I think this is important to mention. People often want to know what's trending in my city, my state. There's no page for that because if it gets too granular, it doesn't stay anonymized. That's the risk. Um, but what I'm going to show you is some sort of hacky ways to get at that. So let's go ahead and actually move to trending searches and I'll show you some of it. So the first thing I'm going to just search for is Virginia. And I want to point out the difference between search terms and topics. This is really important. Search term is these letters as I've literally typed them in. So if I misspelled it, I'm only searching for people who have also misspelled it that exact same way. So as you can imagine, that's not particularly useful. Most of the time you're gonna want the topic and I can see that because it has this sort of subhead, that's my topic page. So that will include misspellings that roll up under it. If people are typing in a different character set or alphabet, or if it's like a celebrity that has a bunch of nicknames, maybe you type in JLo, they're gonna roll up under Jennifer Lopez. So it's gonna always have the bigger set of data. So I'm gonna search for Virginia, and then I'm gonna to start to narrow these items down. So the first thing I'm gonna do is go to the US, and then I wanna to go to Virginia. So I'm clicking on the arrow, I'm scrolling all the way down. I wanna show you that there are regions. I'm gonna stay at the state level, but here we go. So for wherever you're based, you can start to get at what, in, what are people in my area searching for. And then let's see just what people are looking for in Virginia in the last day. So what this means is all of the searchers will be in Virginia and these are last day searches and they're searching for the word Virginia. So what we're looking for, you might think, how is that helpful? Is we wanna get at these related queries. So it looks like there was a power outage in Hampton. We can see Powerball, lottery stories, et cetera. And then this, of course, you all know about this story. I'm seeing it all over my social, that tip line. So many interesting things to be done with that. So when people are searching for Virginia inside of Virginia, this is the six most popular thing that they're looking for. What we can also do, since you've got a new governor and he is doing interesting things. So again, search term, if I misspelled it, if I only put one in or if I mistyped it like that, which I continue to do, it would only be searching for that misspelling. So not super helpful, but when I click on the topic, First thing I can see is how he is searched compared to Virginia, which is less so. So if you also wanna see sort of who's more popular or what's more popular, this graph can get pretty interesting. But what I wanna do for story origination is looking for Youngkin. Here's where he's being searched for the most within the state. And then what people are looking for when they're looking for his name. So they wanna know about his education plan, the different things he's doing with mask mandates, maybe, et cetera. We also are gonna to get to critical race theory, tip line, et cetera. But then as I was looking through this before we started, I was like, why is John Legend there? So if I click on this and I go to just search on Google, this is my way of going, why is that trending? And it's gonna give me lots of information about John Legend, which is not what I'm looking for, but I wanna know why are people connecting these names? And you may know this one already, but it looks like he is joining the call to spam the tip line. So that's pretty interesting. And when I searched for this an hour ago, these stories were not here. And I also don't see a lot of the big publications that I would expect to see. So just at first glance, this tells me there's more to do on this John Legend story. If you wanna get ahead of this trend wave, you could pick that up in the next hour. So this is what this can start to show us. The other thing to point out here is, I mentioned that if it, you ever see breakout, that means it has 5,000% or more interest. And then we can see this level of interest. So there's 200% more interest in the last day on education with Glenn Youngkin than there was the day before. So this is kind of like, what are people talking about, right? Let's get to one of those regional searches. So I'm gonna remove all of these. I'm just gonna search for Richmond. <laughs> Why is it not there? There we go. So if I search for Richmond, I'm in Virginia, I'm gonna actually go to the region. In the last day, let me actually just type it in as well because this could give us a slightly different set of results. 
it's letting me know what I just told you all about, which is search terms and topics are different. And I'm again, I'm going down to related queries. So in the Richmond region, in the last day, when people search for the word Richmond, this is what they're looking for. Weather, open table, doctors, lots about weather, right? And we all know what a traffic driver that could be. Uh, Mekong, the restaurant, the type of thing that people are looking for, snow forecast. These look about the same, but you may get a different set. So this is where if you're just look again through your town, you may be able to find the topic and you may be able to find the search term for it. You could throw in some of your suburbs, for example, and just really get a sense very quickly of what are people looking for. And then do I need a story on this? Some of these things are not news, right? People just want to know where can I get a Hyundai? Maybe that's a story. Um, but there, there can be gems. There won't be gems every time, but I think this can also be a really good way of building support internally for a story idea that you might have or asking for more. Like if you aren't covering weather sort of as it breaks, maybe you're doing it like later in the day. This is a type of thing that's like people are looking for this now. They want this information. So can we move with more urgency? Can we get more on all these different angles? This is the type of thing that people are looking for. Finally, I'll just show one more thing. So um, removing all of these. So again, we're still in Richmond. And this is the sort of even broader hack that can happen. If I just search for the word what. So when people are searching in the Richmond Petersburg area in the last day, if they're looking, when they type in the word what, what else are they looking for? So what's the weather for tomorrow as discussed? What is a charter school? That's interesting. What century are we in? <laughs> um, what is gas lighting? When's the Super Bowl? This can be really good for like um, building one of those sort of like everything you need to know about the Super Bowl type pages. So like what like where can I watch it? What time is it? Who's playing? Um, all of the, what commercials should I expect? The, the questions that people have walking up to something, this is a way of trying to find those questions and get them answered for your story. So I hope that that, I know it, again, I know it can go fast, but I hope that that's interesting. Um, again, these are the things you wanna play with and these are your search terms. I'm gonna pause there. We have just a few minutes left, so I wanna not skip over pinpoint. I think we will maybe wanna go a little deeper on it next week as well. Um, but let's move over to it. So Pinpoint is Google's newest tool that was built specifically with journalists in mind. Everything I've showed you today is free to use. Pinpoint is no exception. There's no, like, if you need a pro account, it costs X, it's just free. It's, and it's only available to journalists and like academic researchers. You can register for an account at g.co slash Pinpoint. The team gets back to journalists and approves those accounts, usually within 24 hours, if not faster. And I'm going to skip a lot of the slides because I really just want to show you the tool. So it can do a bunch of different things. The thing that it was the sort of classic case for Pinpoint would be you've got a bunch of documents on a certain topic and you just don't really know what you have yet. So maybe you've put out a FOIA request and now you've gotten back your request. You've got stuff photocopied all crazy. You've got some things that are photos, you've got some audio files, you've got tons of PDF documents, you've got emails, maybe you FOIA'd for the emails between the mayor and a city council person, something like that. You can start to put it in Pinpoint and help make sense of it right away. So what Pinpoint's gonna do is it's gonna analyze those documents and start to show you some information about them and then you can search through them. So it's really great for, there's that FOIA request example or even thinking about like, if you're a city council reporter, every audio file of all the Zooms that they've done, you can start to just keep them all together, all of the minutes, all of the agendas, all the documents that someday, if you've got your story, you're looking for a certain thing, you've, you've got them all in there together. So I'll show you a little bit more about what that means. Now that I'm in Pinpoint, I'll show you there are these publicly shared document collections. We've got the Mueller report. Everything is, is public, but it's just all here together. Things that have, these are all the court filings for the Mueller report, 48 documents. And then these are some of the ones that I've made. This one I was building out yesterday. So where I live, there's a public housing complex called Golden Gate Village. 
and a lot of interesting things are happening with it. So I just started adding in here what I just described to you. Audio files from the uh, Board of Supervisors meetings, PDFs of plans that are in progress, a letter from HUD, and I can start to see who the players are. So if I wanna know about all of these people, the organizations, the locations, and I can then search through here. So the person who is the head of the residence board, her first name is Royce, and I can start to see what has Royce said about this topic. And here is every time that her name shows up, for example. I'm gonna to go to something that hopefully will connect a little bit better. So these are Apollo documents from NASA, all about the Apollo moon missions. There are 1300 in here. And we can start to see who is mentioned most often, the organizations mentioned most often, and then we can search through here. So in my 1300 documents, if I wanna search for the word moon, every time the moon is talked about, it's in 350 documents. And Pinpoint also has synonym search. So it's saying, hey, if you wanna know about the moon, you might wanna look at this because it's got something about a uh, lunar pilot. So a synonym search for, if you wanna know about moon, you wanna know, you probably wanna know about lunar. If you don't, you could just simply exclude it from your results. It searches handwriting, which I've never seen anything do. I wanna show you what that looks like. So I've searched for Loomis and I've searched for state. And here on this very old file, I got Loomis pretty simply, but I also got state, which is written in cursive. It's written diagonally. It's not super legible. It's not terrible. If your handwriting is terrible, it's, it's hard to read for pinpoint, but it can start to find instances of certain words. So think about like margin notes on bills, names, signatures, just archival material that was handwritten, your own notes. If you wanna put them in, you can search through all of that stuff. Um, and then I mentioned audio. So it's important to call out that you can upload an audio file like an MP3 or there's it supports almost all audio files. And what you're going to get is a transcription. So you can use it for interviews and what you're going to get rather quickly is a transcription file, again, free to use. I know there are a lot of tools that you can pay for for this, but for interviews, for those audio files of like Zoom meetings, you can dump those in, let them be transcribed by pinpoint and then grab your text out of a PDF. And what this has done here is it's, um, it's not perfect. So the copy editor in me wants to sort of tidy this up, but if this is the quote that I'm looking for, if I remember we talked about this person, I search for the name and I can very quickly listen to, it's prompting me to this set of audio so that I can actually then go back and hear it, confirm my quote is correct, pop it in my story, just copy this over, put it in my CMS and sort of move on with my writing. And as we all know, transcription of audio and of interviews can really be a drag and it can slow you down. And this is where I think while pinpoint, it's not perfect, you'll always wanna confirm it yourself. It's getting you 85% of the way there, sometimes more, that you can then very quickly sort of move through your work. So this is where I love the tools to kind of do the heavy lifting for you, save you some time where you can then go use your time on the things that only you can do, coming up with stories, interviewing folks, um, doing the beautiful writing that you do or video production, whatever it is. I'll stop there, we're right at time. I hope that is a, at least a sample of some of the highlights of what Pinpoint can do and piques your interest. Um, please let me know if you have questions. I don't see any in the chat, but I'm happy to take them. So let's see, so Steve says, Backing up to advanced searches, searching for the page of an individual can yield dozens of results in Facebook's internal engine, yes, but no easy way to filter. Using Google, what's the best way to narrow that down based on other information you might have about the person? Interesting. I mean, I think what I would say, Steve, is to search those other pieces of information along with the name, right? And then what you could even do is like site colon facebook.com let's say we're just searching for you, Steve Stewart, and maybe we just put in where you live, we put Richmond or we put what college we might think you attended, that type of thing. So I think I would just start to build a search with everything you might know, right? And kind of come at Facebook from the side in that way. That's a really good question. I'm going to just slide over here. 
to where we're headed next week. Um, so again, at the same time, visualizations and geo, and that third session is gonna be newsroom innovation, not pinpoint, I apologize. But if you have questions on anything we went over today, let's talk about them next time, bring them right at the front. Um, and I hope you will give some of these tools a try. I know it's a lot, um, but I also know how powerful they can be. Thank you so much, Mary. This has been fascinating. I've learned a lot and I can't wait to rejoin you on Thursday to learn more. And I hope we can get Great. more into pinpoint because there's so many possibilities with that. Um, Good. If you have time next week. Um, Absolutely. So just for, for everybody to know, uh, we're going to send uh, a video link out to everybody who attended today once the video has rendered. Um, and I'll, I'll also include a link if you haven't registered for Thursday's visualiz visualization and geo uh, webinar. I'll go ahead and send that out to you guys. You can go ahead and get on board. And that's really all I have to say. Do you have anything more you want to add, Mary, before we go today? I think I have said enough words <laughs> for everyone's <laughs> sake. So thank you. I appreciate your time. And I'll see you again, I hope, next week. Thank you. Have a good afternoon, everyone. Thanks so much. Bye now.